So, so far, what we've seen is that in the hydrogen atoms and single electron atoms, the wave function, and I am just putting the time dependent component under the carpet for the time being, is equal to r, which is a function of small r, the distance from the nucleus. Mobile phones down, please. Theta, capital theta, which is the polar part of the wave function, it only depends upon the angle theta, the polar angle. The azimuthal part of the wave function phi, which only depends upon the azimuthal angle phi. So I'm representing the parameters by small variables and the wave functions by the capital counterparts. And we have three quantum numbers, n, l, and l. N is called the principal quantum number. This is called the orbital quantum number. ML is called the magnetic or the azimuthal quantum number. And why are these quantum numbers given this name? <clears throat> we'll explore in a minute. Now this R, when we looked at the wave functions in a 1D well, we wrote, for example, psi as a function of x. This depends upon n, the quantum number n that we had for 1D well. This was 2 over L under root sine of n by x over L. And n was constrained to be only a positive integer, n to be 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So these are constraints on n that come out because of the boundary conditions. n cannot have any value it desired. It's quantized. Likewise, in the hydrogen atom or single electron atom, these variables, these quantum numbers become quantized. And they cannot have any value they like. L, in fact, depends upon L. And ML depends upon L. So there is, a, there is a kind of regress. These three quantum numbers satisfy certain constraints amongst themselves because you would like to have the wave functions that are continuous, like the wave functions that are finite, bounded. And the constraints that you all know very well from your chemistry lectures is that L goes from 0, 1, up to N minus 1 for a given n, and ml is, goes from minus l all the way to plus l, and it increments in step of plus 1. Okay? So this is something that you already know from your chemistry lessons. And Dependent on these parameters, these quantum numbers, these wave functions are going to change. Just as dependent upon n, this wave function changes in the 1D well. So this r will depend upon these quantum numbers. It turns out that this r depends only upon n and l. This theta depends upon l and ml. Okay? And this phi depends upon ML. So these are our dependences. And we're going to look at these wave functions and we're going to see what these are going to look like. These are actually nothing but the orbitals, as we'll explore in a minute. We're going to draw the orbitals. We're going to draw these orbitals from a first principle. Now, the, what I would like to show you is that not only are these quantum numbers quantized, just as in the 1D infinite well, we have the energies that are quantized. The energies are given by, in a 1D well, they are determined by the principal quantum number n in 1D, and they are given by n squared, h bar squared, pi squared, over 2m l squared, where l is the length of the well. Likewise, 
in the hydrogen atom, when you solve this system, you'll find out that the energies are also quantized. And the energies are quantized, and they only depend upon n, the principal quantum number, which therefore is the most important quantum number. It sets the energy of the levels. Okay, so this quantum number, which is the principal quantum number, is principal because it defines the scale for the energy. And this energy turns out to be equal to minus <coughs> n squared e4, where n is the mass of the electron, 2, 4 pi epsilon naught squared h bar squared with a 1 over n squared. Now this can be derived by solving the Schrodinger equation. In fact, the Bohr's model also gives you the same energy. If you solve the Bohr's model, you get the same energy. Now what you observe here is that the energies are negative. When an electron gets close to the nucleus, it becomes more negative. But this is not just the potential energy. It's the kinetic energy plus the potential energy for the electron. <laughs> so it's the total energy for the electron, but it's quantized. And it's, the quantization is determined by 1 over n squared. This value here, this value here, you can plug in the constant. You can plug in the mass of the electron, E, H bar, the permittivity of free space. And you can find out what this constant is going to be. It turns out to be 13.6 electron volts. So this energy here, En is minus 13.6 electron volts over n squared. So now I can draw an energy spectrum for the hydrogen. Just as I've drawn an energy spectrum for a 2D well, for a 3D well, for a 1D well, I can draw the energy spectrum for hydrogen. For a harmonic oscillator, we draw we do the uh, spectrum. It's equally spaced levels. Here, the levels are not equally spaced. They actually look like the following. So I would just like to superimpose the energy levels on top of the potential energy. This is the potential energy graph. The lowest energy corresponds to n equals 1. So I have an energy here, which is minus 13.6 electron volts. All right. The next energy level corresponds to n equals 2. So I put 2 here, I get minus 13.6 over 4, which is minus 3.4 electron volts. This is the first excited state. So an electron is generally in this ground state in the hydrogen atom. It can be promoted to the first excited state by some photons, by some incoming energy. Then we have n equals 3. So I put 9 here, I get the next energy level. Can anyone tell me what this energy is going to be? Minus 1.5 electron volts. Then the next one is minus 0.8 electron volts. And so these energy levels get closer and closer together. And when the energy is zero, this actually means that the electron has gone out of the nucleus. Because when this energy goes beyond the potential energy, the electron is a free electron. It has gone out of the confines of the bound, bound state of the atom. It's a free electron. And we say that the atom has been ionized. And the amount of energy required to ionize this atom is just the difference between zero and minus 30.6, which is 30.6 electron volts, which is the first ionization potential of hydrogen. Okay, this energy, 3.4 electron volts, is the second ionization potential. So now what you could do is you could excite the hydrogen by applying electric fields, by incoming photons, you can by increasing the temperature as it happens in the sun, for example. So these electrons can go into, if the electron remains bound, it can go into one of these rungs of the ladder. It can go here, here, it can be excited, it can be excited in its 
higher states, it can even be photoionized or ionized by some mechanism. So the electron can go to higher energy states. And when it's in a higher energy state, it can drop back. And it emits a photon of a certain radiation in the process. The photon will have precise wavelength because these energy gaps are precise. The energy gap is delta E, and this will cause the emission of a photon of wavelength lambda. HC over lambda. OK? So now, what I would like to show in front of you is, in fact, this experiment actually is another experiment which shows the quantization of energy inside an atom. We've already seen the Frank Hertz experiment. In the Frank Hertz experiment, we saw the, ionized, the energy manifold, the quantized manifold inside a monetary atom. Now, there were collusions of the electrons with the monetary atoms, and transitions were excited inside the mercury atom, and that was a dip in the collector current. Now, this is an alternative experiment, an alternative way of verifying that there is quantization inside the atom. In fact, by doing spec examples of this kind, experiments of this kind, which are called spectroscopy, you can actually find out the signature of atoms. If the wavelengths that are emitted they are precise, and you get a line spectrum. Instead of getting continuous broadband spectrum, you can actually tell that there are quantized energy levels inside the atom. OK? So this was one of the earlier experiments. You, you were do, we were doing spectroscopy with stellar light, light from stars, absorption spectroscopy, emission spectroscopy, and the line spectrums were obtained, which means that either bands were missing or bands in an emission spectrum were lit up. And these are precise wavelengths. So what I have in front of you here is basically a very simple setup. And you can observe. Uh, the camera is not focused here, so you, can act, you have to actually observe here. So this is a cube. I have cubes of this kind. I have four tubes here in front of me. Now these tubes are evacuated. But before they've been evacuated, some gas has been put into these tubes. So I have a tube of, this is a tube of mercury. OK? Uh, you can actually see some of the ends are silvered because mercury has condensed to the walls. OK, once mercury has been put in, this tube is closed. It's by glass blowing techniques, this tube has been closed shut. So it was evacuated, vacuum was inside the tube, and then some slight amount of vapor of mercury was infused into this tube. When mercury got in, this tube was plugged. So now it's a closed, sealed tube, which has some mercury vapor in it. And on the two ends of this tube, we have electrodes. So here's an electrode, and here is an electrode. So these are metal cylinders, which are connected to the end terminals, which are metal. So it's like a, it's a, like a tube light. So I have mercury in front of me, and I have neon in front of me. This is a neon tube. And I have placed one of the tubes, which actually is a hydrogen tube. This is a hydrogen tube. So this has hydrogen gas suffused into the tube, and the tube is then hermetically sealed. It's closed. And this tube is then placed inside a tube holder that we've constructed. And cables are connected to these end plugs, and these cables are then connected to a power supply, to a high voltage power supply, probably a thousand volts, so that an electric field can be established inside this tube, and the electrons can be excited. The electrons can go to higher excited states. Once they go to higher excited states, they can fall down, they can come down, and emit radiation in the process of precise wavelength. Now we would like to see what the wavelengths are, whether we get a continuous spectrum or, or uh, a line spectrum. And now how are we going to observe the spectrum? Right in front of 
you, there's an optical fiber. This optical fiber has its end very placed close to the tube. So there will be discharge in this tube. There will be some glow of some color. The wavelengths and frequencies correspond to colors. So there will be a characteristic color for this tube. And then this signal is going to come into the fiber and it's go going into this device, which is a spectrometer. This is an advanced version of what we call a prism. This doesn't have a prism in it, it has a grating. So what this grating does is that when light comes in through the optical fiber, it disperses that light and separates out the wavelengths. <laughs> when the wavelengths are separated out, you can measure what the wavelengths are with, with the help of a detector that is placed inside this spectrometer. This spectrometer is then connected to the computer over here and on the screen, you will see what the spectrum is going to look like. First of all, I'm going to turn this on, and then I'm going to turn off the lights and I'm going to see the spectrum. So here there is, this is the interface of the spectrometer. This is wavelength in nanometers. So the horn is a bit small. I don't know how to adjust this, but this is 400 nanometers, 500, 600, all the way up to 110, 1100 nanometers. So this is roughly the visible range. From 400 to 800 or so, we have the visible range. And beyond that, we have the infrared range. Okay, so this spectrometer is capable of detecting in the, in the visible and near infrared regime. And this, this actually shows the, the counts, which means the intensity versus the wavelength. Whenever we have intensity versus the wavelength, it's called a spectrum. Now, by looking at this energy manifold inside the hydrogen atom, we would like to find out what lines are possible, what lines are emitted, and what does the spectrum look like. So we can predict what wavelengths to see. Okay? And if we look at the prediction, Now if you look at the computer screen, I have pulled up a database which corresponds to hydrogen. This is an atomic structures database. So here you would see that <clears throat> this is the intensity in relative units. So the most intense peak, 1000, units is seen for a wavelength of 121 nanometers. This wavelength, 121 nanometers, corresponds to the gap between 3.4 electron volts and 13.6 electron volts. This gap is 10.2 electron volts. Okay? 10.2 electron volts, if you plug this in here, the wavelength turns out to be 121 nanometers. So the strongest peak is coming out from this transition over here. <laughs> so if hydrogen is excited, thermal means, electric means, optical means, electrons come here and then they fall back, they will emit radiation of 121 nanometers precisely. Of course, you can't read the uncertainty principle, keep that in mind. So the strongest peak is seen for 121 nanometers. But our problem is that this is in the UV regime the ultraviolet regime. And our spectrometer is not capable of seeing in the ultraviolet regime. We need a specialized spectrometer for this, which I cannot bring to the classroom. Okay? So I would like to expect probably transitions between other energy levels over here, which are shorter energy, shorter energy gaps, so the wavelength is longer. And I would expect that some of these wavelengths will lie in the visible regime. And of course they do. If I look at these curves, uh, this particular uh, intensity, it's 60 on a scale of 1,000, 90 on a scale of 1,000, 30 on a scale of 1,000, 180 on a scale of 1,000. This wavelength is around 480 nanometers, 485 nanometers. And this wavelength is around 650 nanometers. So I can expect to see these peaks on my spectrometer. 
if I activate the discharge. Okay, let's see what's going to happen. So now what I'm going to do, I'm turning back the spectrometer on. First of all, before I do that, I just turn on this tube. Okay, I don't need to go ahead. So first of all, you actually see a particular pinkish glow, a pinky glow for hydrogen atoms. Every element is going to give a characteristic glow. This pink glow is actually coming from the wavelengths over here, about 650 nanometers intermixed with this blue. This is giving a pink, pinkish tinge to the color. Okay? Every element, so by looking at the color, you can actually do spectroscopy. And that, you can also tell the temperature as well, by the way. So now if I open up the spectrum, this is what the spectrum is looking like. So if you observe here, the first thing that you see, which is something very technical and quite unusual is, a drifting baseline. This is due to temperature variations, but ignore these for the minute. You see a large peak at about 480 nanometers. This is the spectrum. Just to verify that this is indeed a spectrum, I'm going to turn this off. So this is this was the spectrum. Believe me. And I'm going to turn it back on. I'm not tricking you. So this is the spectrum. And I see a nice peak at 486 nanometers, 480 nanometers roughly, sorry. And I see a large peak around 650 or 660 nanometers. And I see these other peaks as well. OK? Now each peak, this is a line spectrum. It's not a continuous spectrum. Does anyone have a mobile phone which is on? And with the, with the camera, with the light, sorry? <coughs> So this is an example of, of a broadband spectrum, right? It's a broad peak over here. It's a hump, it's not a line, okay? So this light that is emitted from this LED has a range of wavelengths. It's a continuous spectrum. It's totally different from the spectrum that we see, which is a line spectrum. So I'm going to turn this back on. All right. So now in this spectrum, you see discrete lines. The first thing that you observe is that you see nothing here, nothing here, and then you see a line. Because this actually tells us that these energies are quantized inside the hydrogen atom. And each line has a different line width. And the line widths can be explained by three different reasons. And I'm going to tell you about these three reasons in a minute. But this actually is a vivid demonstration that the energy levels inside hydrogen are quantized. So now let me change the tube and move on to another tube to see how the spectrum is going to change.
Now this is the second cube that I would like to put in. This is a neon cube. Familiar with neon signs? All of you are familiar with these signs? Sign boards? Neon signs are red. A helium neon laser gives you red light because that's coming from the neon atom. And of course we see a red color here. This wavelength is centered around 650, 630, 640, 640 nanometers. And this is the line spectrum which is clustered around 600, 650, up to 700 nanometers which corresponds to red color. And by looking at the line spectrum, it's a jumble of lines because it's a more complex atom. There are 10 electrons inside this atom. There are 10 protons inside this atom. So the potential energy manifold is going to change. It's not a single electron atom anymore. It's a more complicated atom. Even though it's a noble gas, an inert gas, it's a more complicated atom, a bigger atom, more protons, more electrons, the electrons not only talk to the protons, the electrons interact with themselves as well. So the potential energy depends upon the distance between two electrons as well. And that is a positive contribution. <coughs> electrons are both negatively charged. So the system is more complex. In fact, you cannot solve the Schrodinger equation for the system because the potential energy is so complex. So you can at best do approximations. And when you do all of those approximations, you can actually simulate the spectrum as well, but this is what it looks like in real life. It's a line spectrum, it's an emission spectrum, nice peak, nice cornucopia of peaks, arranged between around 650 nanometers, which give the red color to, to the neon glow. Okay? And once again, if you observe closely, all of these peaks, have different widths. So I'm going to see if I can zoom in. Look at these peaks. So I've zoomed in onto the region where I see this jungle of peaks. Now you will observe that all of these peaks have different widths. This is a narrower peak, a narrower peak. This is a broad peak, another broad peak. These are two peaks close together. These are two peaks close together. The spectrometer does not have a good enough resolution to resolve these peaks, okay? And the peaks have different heights as well. The intensities are different. So once you have an energy manifold, certain processes in certain transitions in this energy spectrum will be more likely, certain will be less likely. The more likely transitions will give you bigger peaks, will give you bigger intensities. That's where atomic physics comes in. And I, I'm sure most of you might like to become physicists. And if you take a course on atomic physics, this is what you learn. What are the intensities? And this spectrum is actually a signature. It's a Nadra CNIC for neon, for elements. So this is a signature of elements. By looking at the line spectrum, you can actually tell what the spectrum is. This is the fingerprint of the element. Let's look at our third example, which is of mercury. This is neon, distinct color, once again. What color would mercury be? Orange? Sodium is yellow. Street, light, street lamps are sodium. It's generally bluish white. Okay. I 
I'm sure you're convinced after taking a modern physics course that confinement leads to quantization. Life is quantized. Even if you walk home with this lesson after 30 <coughs> lectures, I'll be a satisfied person. All right, so this is Mercury. I'm going to zoom out. Now, how do you zoom out? OK. This is the spectrum of Mercury. There's a sharp peak over here in this regime, 550 nanometers. There's a peak here at about 450 nanometers. And then this, there's a whole range of peaks of different sizes, different wavelengths. And this corresponds to the spectrum of Mercury. Now these are Mercury atoms. In the previous lecture, we, we actually looked at these transitions in an indirect fashion by collisions with electrons. And we measured the current through a discharge tube, which comprised Mercury. Now we're doing something totally different. We're looking at the atomic energy levels and a large number of them by looking at the light emitted from these mercury atoms, which have been excited by the presence of an electric field, a strong electric field. Now, actually, by moving this peak here, uh, sorry. So I can actually measure the peaks as well. Okay, so this is what the spectrum looks like for mercury, neon, and hydrogen. So let's move on now. And let's look at the wave functions. Any questions about these line spectra? So this is how astronomy is done as well. You look at the spectrums by pointing your telescopes in different directions, look at the spectrum of stars. What elements are inside the stars? What elements are in the intervening space between Earth and the star? Yes. Uh, energy depends only on n for a single electron atom. If you have multi-electron atom, the energy will also depend upon n as well as on l. Okay? So when you solve the Schrodinger equation, find out the energy, it turns out to be only a function of n for single electron atoms inside a central plane. Okay? Now I need to keep the lights on a little bit. So you, I wonder if you can see see this screen from the back. Very hard to see. Okay, I'll write this down on the blackboard. ground state. Let's look at R, function of R, n equals 1. When n equals 1, l can only be 0. There's no other choice. Now this function is some constant. I'm going to write this constant as k. This constant over here, I'm going to write this as k. I don't want to bother you with what k is. It's not important for my argument. E raised power minus R over A naught. I'm going to figure out what this what this A naught is. All right. So this is the wave function, the radial part of the wave function. And it turns out that if L equals one, then
So, if you look at the overall wave function, please pay attention, last 5 minutes please, r, theta and phi. The theta and phi here, they have been lumped together and called y. They have been called y of this table. This table has already, already been uploaded. This is just a constant. Just a constant. It doesn't have any theta dependence and phi dependence when L equals 0. If L equals 0, ML equals 0. And for L equals 0, ML equals 0, which is this 0 and this 0, there is no dependence upon R, theta and phi. So the overall wave function is just when N equals 1, L equals 0, n l equals 0 is just proportional to some constant in e raised for minus r over a naught. Now I would like to plot this wave function, which means I would like to make a graph between this wave function. Now this is real. It's real. It turns out to be real, so I can directly plot it. This wave function which is proportional to r because everything else is a constant for these particular values of the quantum numbers if I would like to plot this as a function of r what is this plot going to look like? it's going to look like a decay how would that decay look like? it's an exponential decay like this. So where is the maximum probability of finding the electron if the electron was in this state? At the nucleus. Do you ever find an electron at the nucleus inside the hydrogen atom? So what's wrong with this? Sorry? Uncertainty principle. But what's wrong with this wave function? The wave function, the modulus square of the wave function should actually tell you where there is highest likelihood of finding the electron. So this wave function actually presents to you the dilemma, the conundrum, that maybe the electron has the highest probability of being located at the nucleus at r equals 0. But you know from experience, you know from your 12 years of education that this is not going to happen. The electron is not at the nucleus. The uncertainty principle forbids it. But the wave function is telling you another story. It's telling you that this highest likelihood of finding the electron at the nucleus. But that's not true. Can you come up with an answer, a resolution to this apparent paradox? Think of it. You want to find out the probability of locating the electron in a certain region. So if I take this wave function, if I take the modulus square of this wave function, it's still going to look like the same. It's not going to change much. It still has its maximum here. So I need the probability density, but that's not working out. So what's the apparent resolution to this paradox? Yes? Excellent. Really good. So what we have to do is the following. I have a nucleus and the electron has a certain wave function. Now how can I draw a wave function? I can just draw points. The points represent the probability density. So I can draw points. 
This is what is conventionally called an electron cloud. So I can draw a cloud, a scatter of points, which means that if I were to perform an experiment trying to locate the position of the electron, when it's in the n equals 1, l equals 0, n equals 0 state, then I can find that it's located somewhere. Either the outcome would be here, here, here. The location could come out anywhere. So if I perform the experiment on a large number of identical hydrogen atoms in the ground state, I can construct this scatter plot, which is generally called a cloud, an electron cloud. So this is like microscopy of a hydrogen atom. Now the question is, what is the pro the question that you would like to ask? What is the probability of finding an electron at a certain ra radius r? But you need to specify a region. Okay, so you want to find out the probability of finding an electron in a shell. in a shell of at radius r of an infinitesimal, a really small thickness dr. You want to find this probability of locating the electron within a shell of thickness dr, which is minute, minuscule, which has a distance r from the nucleus. That's what you want to find out. Okay? And you can change this r. Now, <coughs> If I would like to find the probability of locating the electron inside inside dr at r, so the dr, the shell, this shell is at r. <laughs> what you would need to do is, you know what the probability density is? is Psi star psi probability density per unit volume. And then you need to find out the volume. You multiply this with the small with the volume of the shell. That's how you find out the probability. This is the probability per unit volume. You multiply it with the volume of the region over which you're trying to locate the particle. In 1D, the probability was given by dx psi modulus squared. Probability per unit length called the probability density multiplied by the small thickness that over which you're considering the uh, interval. Here, and exactly analogous to this, you have to find out the volume of this region. So the volume, what's the volume of this shell? 4 pi r What's the word? 4 pi r squared dr. So the probability of look, now this dr can be really small, whatever you desire. So in fact, if you want to, the probability density per unit radius, if I were to define the probability per unit radius, what is that probability going to be? That probability is going to be 4 pi r square So this is the probability per unit radius multiplied by the thickness or the differential radius. This is the probability per unit radius multiplied by the thickness or probability per unit distance away from the nucleus multiplied by the overall thickness and if you want to integrate this you can get a bigger volume as well but this is just the probability inside this shell and this is the probability per unit radius it's called the radial probability density so now what you observe is that this object here is not sufficient to describe the probability density per unit radius, you have to multiply this with r square as well. So now I have the prob this probability density, the bare probability density, 
this is just the square over there. It's going to give me a graph like this. I take the square of that graph, and then I multiply this graph with a graph of R squared. And this graph is going to look like a parabola. So now I take a point here, and I multiply it to the corresponding point here. I do this point by point multiplication because I'm multiplying this graph here with this R squared. What kind of graph do I obtain? R radial probability density. This graph will actually, R squared is zero here, it's going to look like this. So the radial probability density is indeed zero at the nucleus. At R equals zero per unit, if you take a small distance near the nucleus, there is zero probability of locating the electron near the nucleus. And there is maximum probability of locating the electron somewhere. This graph has a hump to it. It's a maximum to it. Now if you look at this hump, how can you find this hump mathematically? You know what psi is. You take the modulus square, multiply it with the R square, take the derivative with respect to R, you can find where the hump is. Do this as a homework. This hump will be at A0, which is the Bohr radius. Inshallah, see you Tuesday. <laughs>